when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen? Amen. And we're not long, are we? I think about a stanza in the song we sung first. You remember the song we sung before that, Jesus? Do you believe that? What a day of rejoicing. Jesus says, there's a one stanza in that uh, uh, song that says, Earth shall keep her jubilee. You know, that's what Ellen Mason was talking about. The songwriters knew that earth shall keep her jubilee. We're almost nearing that time right now. We need Jesus to do something special for us. What do you say? We are going to cover something very significant uh, this evening, this afternoon, and we have to be ready to study. Are you ready to study? You have pen and paper. You don't eat too much. You're wide awake. What is our objective? We're no longer studying so much why. We're studying what? What? And what are we studying? What, what? What is the work? Now, we've spoken about finishing the work, finishing the work. It's clear that seven Adventists have been called on the scene to finish the work. Jesus finished the work. Now we need to understand what is the work. And by God's grace, we can't exhaust it, but we hope to cover that very clearly uh, by God's grace this afternoon. If we know what to do and we connect with Jesus, we're going to see this work finished and we shall be successful by working with him. What do you say? Amen. And so before we get into the study, I want to waste no ado. We need every minute. So if you're reverently near with me as we approach the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we have heard some wonderful things today. Blessed are our ears and our eyes. And yet to some it seems like a strange thing when yet it's the truth that Jesus has given us. And, oh, Father, we don't want to close our eyes because others are rejecting you. We are told that Jesus would be despised and rejected. But, oh, Lord, we want to accept you. We want to have this experience with you. We want to have this fellowship, this vital connection, this partaking of the divine nature that we will never fall again. Bring us to this point, Lord, where we will stand. And I plead, Lord, that you will electrify our mind. Charge us now with that heavenly current that moves through the spirit of Christ. And may it move in this room tonight, this afternoon, as we get into our subject, what is the work and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to start in 1 John. We want to start in 1 John, the third chapter. And this is almost parenthetical, but it's right to the point. But we want to start in 1 John, chapter 3. And as we're turning to 1 John, chapter 3, just before the book of Revelation, I want you to notice on the screen, in the School of the Prophets, what they were learning. They were learning what this work was. And you'll notice there I have three texts of Scripture with three great scenes. What's the first text of Scripture? Genesis 3.15. What's the second text of Scripture? Daniel 8.14. What's the third text of Scripture? Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Now, all of these Scriptures actually unify to one place. And all of them are actually talking about the work. They're talking about the work that must be accomplished in order for the work to be finished. And we want to grab these texts and make sure that we see how all of them fit together. Genesis 3.15, Daniel 8.14, and Revelation 14, 6 through 12. What does Genesis 3.15 tell us? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise, bruise what? Thy head, he's talking to Satan, and thy shall bruise his heel. Daniel 8, 14, repeat it with me. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Revelation 14, I would tell you to repeat all of this, but for sake of time, just tell me where it's found. 6 through 12. And what are those? That is talking about the three angels' messages. Remember that. I just put that on the table. Now, our objective is, what is the? Is that clear? 
you got to make sure you understand the question before you can really get the right answer. When you don't ask the right question, you definitely don't get the right answer. That's why the Daniel 8, 14 was set up with a question. You've got to understand questions. Daniel 8, 13 gives us the question. Daniel 8, 14 gives us the answer. So this is the question. What is the work, the duties that need to be finished? Is work and duty the same thing? Yes. The duty is the work that needs to be done or the thing that needs to be done or the duty that needs to be done. So the work being finished is the duties that need to be accomplished in order to finish the work. And then how will this work be finished? We won't be able to co cover that so much uh, this session, but we'll uh, go into it. Because once we know what has to happen, then we need to know how it's going to happen. Amen? Now, what is our basic problem as a people? We studied it already. What is our basic problem? As a people, no, no, no sin, it's the issue that needs to be solved, but, but what is our basic problem as a denomination? Yes, we're asleep. That sleepness has done something to us. Let me, let me give you a text. Let me give you a text. Let me give you a text. Proverbs 29, 18. Without a, the people perish. What's our basic problem? We've lost our vision. That's our basic problem. You see, if we had our vision, it would wake us up. <laughs> but our problem is we've lost sight of it, and so we're perishing. We're dying. And the only thing that's going to revive us is to give us the vision that brought us into existence. Write the vision and make it plain. plain. Habakkuk 2 2. So that those that read it may do what? You think it's time to run? When a man runs, that means that we have a little time. What if you was out there, you knew you had to get in here, you said, I better run in there and get there before I'm late. Run. And so it says that we have to read this and if we're going to be able to run and those who read it. Now, we found out that uh, this vision is the vision of Daniel 8, 14. We're going to study it. What is the work that needs to be done? Now, in the school of the prophets, they studied many things, but what was the object of all their studies? Talk to me. What was the object? The Ten Commandments had an object. What was the object of their study? It says there are many stu subjects, but it was the grand object of all study to do what? To learn the will of God and the... So the great objective of the school of the prophets, they studied many things, but one objective, and that was what is the work that we're supposed to do? So in these schools of the prophets, we need to understand what the work is. So if we study what the work is, the duties, are we doing the same thing they did in the school of the prophets? All right. So it says, the central object of all that system, it talked about the great truths set forth by the types and shadows of the Mosaic law were brought to view. And faith grasped the central object of what? All that system. Did we hear about types and antitypes? Did you start seeing them in the sanctuary? Passover is a type. Unleavened bread is a type. First fruits is a type. Pentecost is a type. Feast of Trumpets is a type. Day of Atonement is a type. Then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. All these are types. Spring types, fall types. So when we're looking at all these types. They studied these in the, in, in, in the school of the prophets. The great truths set forth by the types and shadows of the Mosaic law. Talking about Deuteronomy, Genesis to Deuteronomy, that sanctuary system. It says we're brought to view and faith grants the central object of all that system. So what is the main purpose of the sanctuary? It's right here. The Lamb of God that does what? Taketh away the sin of the world. Now remember now, the work will never be finished until the sin is what? When Jesus said it is finished, why, why could he say that? Because he was the Lamb doing what? Dying on the cross. And what did he say? Behold the... Now, I ask you a question. Now, Brother Mason brought out a point that the, 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 the sanctuary on earth was just a temporary temple that God used until he can once again do what? Dwell in us. So what has to, what has to be taken away before God can dwell in us? Okay, remember this? Behold the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world. So Jesus cannot finish his work until the sin was what? And we're going to find out, not, not blotted out, but taken away. There's a difference. And this is a big difference, and we have to see it. So sin was taken off of this earth because of what Jesus did at the cross. Now, this is very important. Behold the Lamb of God, which? 
take away the sin of the world. But when he took it away, he didn't just kill it. He didn't just destroy it. It wasn't blotted out, but it was taken away. It was taken off this earth. And we find out that the work could never be finished on earth until it was taken away. But we have to find out that the sin was actually taken to the sanctuary. Didn't you see that? You saw the veil, Adam mixing that up and the blood. I thought that was wonderful. I said, man, I need that veil. <laughs> blood on the veil. And then the blood will appear, all of a sudden sin appeared. I said, man, that's serious. Then all of a sudden, what took place? It was taken away, and then it was finished. So we got to study this. Oh, brothers and sisters, I, I, you see, I just want to just dump it all out right now. Okay. But we let it, now question, question, question. Bring another question. So we have to understand our duty. We're going to find out that God can't take that sin away unless humanity does a particular duty while the priest is doing a duty. Now, where are we going to find the duty? Because this is the work that must be done. And where is the key of finding this duty? Where are we going to find this? Thy way, O God, is there. Is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? Psalm. Where in Psalms? 77. What verse? You're in the school of the prophets. Praise God. Now, let's read together. This says, all Israel. Now, this is the type. In the type, did the congregation have to do something before the sins were blotted out? In the type. Was there a duty of the congregation? What would the duty of the con congregation have done if there was no high priest? What would their duties have done if there was no high priest? Without me, you can do. Would the duty of the congregation cleanse the sanctuary if there was no high priest? But what would the high priest be able to do if the congregation did not do their duty? Nothing. So we see even in the sanctuary a combination of humanity and this is the key, brothers and sisters. So any righteousness by faith, listen to me, any righteousness by faith that says it's all God, that the sinner does nothing, God does everything, it's a counterfeit. It's not in the sanctuary. And any righteousness by faith that says that the sinner must do everything and God's going to do nothing, we must work our way to heaven, that's not in the sanctuary. There must be a combination of humanity combining with thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Now, look what this says. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, this is typical, all Israel, you can read this in Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23, but it says all Israel were required to do what? Gather about the, so what do we need to be doing if we're getting ready to finish the work? We have to gather about the sanctuary. It says, and in the most solemn manner, humble their souls before God, that they may receive the pardon of their sins and not be what? Cut off from the congregation. If they were cut off, that means they were shaken out. You better remember that. Because there's an event that tells us when we're shaken out. Watch. It says, from, uh, cut off from the congregation. How much more essential? Question. Was the typical more solemn or the anti-typical day of atonement more solemn? Anti-typical. Now, do you know on the typical day in the Jewish nation, they call it Yom Kippur. Even today, every Jewish shop closes down. Even today, they fast on that day. Even today, they do nothing on that day because they say it's a day of judgment. But this says it is not more essential. It is much more essential in this what? Anti-typical day of atonement. That we understand first, number one, the work of our high priest. Listen, if we don't understand his work, this is the part of God. Then we'll never understand our work, that's the part of man. So there are two parts, God's work, man's work. God's duty, man's duty. This says we must understand the work of our great high priest and then what? Know what duties are required of what? So there are some essential duties that are not electives. We can't choose them. There are required duties that must be accomplished on the Day of Atonement. Does it make sense? You're going to find out that health reform is one of those duties. You're going to see it right in the Day of Atonement. Now, let's go forward. More than that, though. Now, watch what it says. Great Controversy 423. It says, the subject of the sanctuary. Now, i got to go back a little bit and, and, and kind of review as we go forward to get into the heart of what we're studying. You don't mind reviewing, do you? The subject of the sanctuary was the, it was the what? I wish you would just circle that, write it down, the key, the key, the key, and make sure that you know what the key is. Amen? Let's say it again. What was the key? The subject of the sanctuary was the, 
Now go in your Bible to Luke 11. Let's go to Luke 11. We'll come back to uh, 1 John 3. Go to Luke 11. Go to Luke 11. Luke 11. The subject of the sanctuary was the key, which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of what? 1844. Now, a, a student in the school of the prophets asked a question. They said, why did it say the su subject of the sanctuary not is the key, but what? Was the key. Now, that tells me of a student trying to really study. Amen? They're looking at every word, and we must do that. But the answer is right here. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the what? Mystery of the disappointment of 1844. We are not right now in the mystery of the dis disappointment of 1844, are we? In 1844, those people were looking for Jesus to come, and when he didn't come, they would either have to give up their faith in God and the Bible, because if Daniel 8, 14 was not right, there's no such thing as God. The Bible could not be trusted. And so in Daniel 8, 14, they couldn't, they couldn't rectify it. Every one of them would have to become atheists. Every Adventist would have become an atheist if this could not be explained. But something explained their disappointment. The subject of the what? But now, get this, the same thing that explained their duty, uh, their uh, disappointment in the past is the same key that unlocks our understanding to the present and to the future. Are you with me? The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the disappointment of, 1840, uh, 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 disappointment of 1844. It did what? Open to view a complete, do we need anything else other than the sanctuary? Why not? What word in there lets us know we don't need any other truth? A complete, now notice the next word. System. Oh, brothers and sisters, you better, you, you better circle that word system. The complete, say that with me, system of truth. One more time. Complete system of truth. You're going to find that the system is what God wanted to put in this church. There's a system that runs every Seventh-day Adventist institution. And if you don't have this system, you'll never get an outpost. This is what God in his school of the prophets wants to plant in his church so that he can produce the, 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 the models of the outpost that's going to finish the work. But you're going to find out that the devil has a system. And in his seminaries, he wants to implant his system, and his system is running every city that's in the, every school that's in the city. We're going to see that. His system is running every church that is using uh, and getting rid of the spirit of prophecy. His system is running all this, and we're going to find out that these two systems both right now are operating inside of the Seventh Adventist Church right now today, both systems. But at the Sunday law, God is going to sweep away one of the systems, and one is going to remain. Remember this now. And the ones that are connected to the wrong system, they don't have life support. They're going to die. <laughs> but the system that is connected to the sanctuary, and you're going to find out that only those schools that leave the cities and get into the country are going to be connected to the life support. They're going to be on the right system. And as a result, when the same law passes, they're going to continue. But the ones in the cities, we're going to find that all that's going to be swept away. The storm and tempest is going to sweep away that structure. But it says, it opens to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing us that God's what? Do you love it that God's hand is holding you? You're in the palm of his hand. God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing what? Is that present truth? Revealing present duty as it, now how did it reveal present duty? What did it do? As it brought to light the position and what? Work of his people. So as it, the present truth is the position and work of the people where they must be when Christ is in the most holy place finishing the work. Are you with me? We found out that the subject of the sanctuary was the? Now, if you were the devil, if that subject of the sanctuary was the key, if you were the devil, what would you do to that key? I'd take it away, wouldn't you? Now, the thing is, he can't destroy it. <laughs> He would love to destroy it, but he can't do it. Once you know the key is, you see why he can't do it. But at least he can hide it from us. Luke 11, let's go there. You're, you're, you should be there, amen? Let's read verses 51. Here's Jesus talking, getting close to the end of his ministry. Now, I'm telling you, Jesus understood all this. I wish we'd go back, but we don't have time to fully go back just now. But in verse 50, 
it says that the blood of all the prophets, you know, this is the same sermon of Matthew 23, just in another place. The blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of what? Of the world may be required of what? This generation. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 51. We have time to unpack that right now. But verse 51 says, from the blood of what? That's at the very beginning. Unto the blood of Zacharias, which perishes between the altar and the temple, verily I say to you, it shall be required of, what's again? This generation. Then he says something. What's the problem? Verse 52. Whoa. Now when the Bible says whoa, that means whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Listen up. Woe unto you who? Lawyers or lawyers. For you have taken away the what? You have taken away what? The key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering, ye did what? I promise you this is the same key. <laughs> it was that taking away the key of knowledge that made the Jewish nation reject Jesus. They did not have the knowledge that would allow them to know that Jesus was the Messiah because the key of knowledge had been taken away and it was locked up to them. But there was one whom the government would be upon his shoulder and the keys were there too. The key of David. The key that openeth and no man can shut. And the key that shut up and no man can open. You will notice, brothers and sisters, that Jesus had that key. And you will find out that he gave that key back to the church of Philadelphia. When you study that, you will find out that that was the Adventist church before 1844. When he opens the door, those who went into the most holy place, they got the key back that had been lost. And it has to get it back in order to finish the work. So it says that this key of knowledge, he took it away. Now, who took the key away? Please talk to me. I, I can't spend too much time here, but I, I want to at least prep you. Because tomorrow I know Elder Mason will get here by God's grace. Lawyers. Who were the lawyers? They were the lawyers. They were the ones that set up the Mosaic law. They sat in the seat of Moses, if you go to Matthew 23, you will find out Jesus says the same thing. They hindered those from going in, but he said these were those who sat in Moses' seat. Now, why is that so important? Who was it that set the laws for the religious system? Was it the priest that set the laws? Was it the priest that, 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 that set up these laws? It was the lawyers. It was those who were sitting in Moses' seat. He said, remember, they tell you to do this. They bind things upon you. They tell you what to do and not to do. These were the lawyers. These were the people who set in place the way the regulations of the church was to be run, and the priests simply carried out what they were told. Are you following me? Now, my brothers and sisters, it's going to be amazing. That's why the priests were so afraid, because the law had already been made. If you confess Christ, the law had been put in place. You were, even the priests were subject to these laws. Now, there was a particular seat that made these laws, and we're going to call it systematic theology. You better listen to this. It was, the, remember now, we're talking about a complete system of truth. Now, in the seminary, what seat sets up what the minister is supposed to preach? What seat is it that sets up in the seminary what the minister is supposed to preach? It is the seat of what? Systematic theology. You can find this in our seminaries right now. Now, you need to find out when did the wrong system get put in that seat? I'm not going to tell you that, but you're going to find out tomorrow. Amen? I'll just introduce you that, that it was fully laid the foundation of completely in 1952. Seeds were going already before that. But now let's come back now. So this happened even in Christ's day, the same thing that caused this, that planned this in, took away the key of knowledge. But the key of knowledge is the subject of the, the subject of the sanctuary, the correct understanding. Let's go a little further. The subject of the sanctuary was the? Key, it opened up the position and work of God's people. Tell me, if the Jews had really understood the sanctuary, what would they have known about Jesus? That he was the, the Messiah. Am I right or wrong? But they didn't understand. They were still killing lambs. They saw the symbols, but they did not know what the symbol pointed to. 
And many of us, we see the symbols of the three angels, but we don't know what the symbols point to. We don't know what is contained inside of these three angels. So we've got to open it up. Remember what we said? That the three angels was our work. This is the work. The three angels, the giving, the practicing, and preaching of the three angels' messages is our work. Am I right? So we're talking about what is the work. The work is the preaching and practicing of the three angels. It says... Talking about seven Adventists, it says, we read this before, they have been given a work of the most solemn import. Hyphen. What is this work? The proclamation of the what? First, second, and third angels. There's no other work of so great importance. They are to allow how much? Now, if there's nothing else, that tells me that everything we need is in those three angels. Am I right or wrong? That's the complete system. So it says, nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, that's volume 9, page 19, but watch now. This says... All, the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the? So which one of the three angels do we need? All of them, praise God. What is the most essential of the three? The third. It says, it says the theme of greatest importance is what? So what is the most important message of the three? The third. But when you need all of them, you can't get to three unless you have one and two. Am I right? You'll never get the three unless you come first to one and two. And it says the third angel's message, but what must it do? It must embrace. What does it mean to embrace? So the third angel must be holding on to the first and second. They are connected. So it says uh, the theme of greatest importance of the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels. All should understand the truth. This is our work. Contain where? So there is truth contained, not on the outside, but contained where? So if you just say I have the three angels' messages, is that enough? The me the, 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 what we need is where? Inside of those messages. Now, in order to get inside, you need to have a key that can unlock them. Am I right? You need a key? Now, the devil has taken away many keys. But the subject of the sanctuary is the? So you will never fully understand the three angels' messages until you've been introduced to the subject of the? Sanctuary. The sanctuary, the three angels point you to the sanctuary, and then the sanctuary helps you to understand the three angels. Are you with me? All right. The truth contained in the messages. And then once we understand what's in them, is it enough just to know what's in them? Then what must we do? Demonstrate them. Does that sound like a duty? Does that sound like something for us to do? So once we understand what's in the message, then it says, then we must demonstrate them how? So do you know then I can look at how you daily live, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath, and know if you have the truth contained. I wonder if the outpost centers that are running Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sabbath is the demonstration of this in our daily lives. That's my question. We won't answer it fully just now. But it says the truth contained in these messages is not enough just to do it on the Sabbath, is it? We need something that will have a program that can be demonstrated every day of our lives. And the loud cry will never be preached until this happens. Heavenly Father, I see that we need angels to help us and tap us on the shoulders. Lord, this is so serious that the devil doesn't want us to hear this. And sometimes what we do naturally, Lord, some, Lord, we've been studying so much, we've been taxing our minds, we've been up early and what have you. Lord, please give us the Holy Spirit to electrify us. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We've got to slow down and study this. I can't go speed past this. I want you to make sure that we, I'm learning too, amen, that we understand this. We have to tax our minds. You should be praying. You remember when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross? His disciples were in Gethsemane. Jesus said, watch with me for an hour. And all of a sudden, as he was praying and preparing, what did the devil do to them? He put them to sleep. And it wasn't a natural sleep. It wasn't natural. Read these Iron Ages. Inspiration says that a supernatural stupor was put on those disciples because that would have prepared them for the crisis. And she says every time this truth, this particular truth is talked about, she says the devil is snatching to catch away everything so that we might not understand the best truth that we most, most need to understand. So the devil is coming right here and saying, look, I better put him, if I couldn't get him to sleep this morning, I better put him to sleep now because if I do it now, they'll never understand the word. You know what Spirit Prophecy says? Jesus woke him up. So it's all right if I wake you up. Amen. Amen. I'm following the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus woke him up lovingly. He woke him up, and then he said, watch and pray. And you know what Spirit Prophecy says? That if they would have pleaded, Lord, keep me awake, then they would have been awake and ready. Let's stop again. Lord, keep us awake. 
not just physically, but keep us awake spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's, a, it's possible to have our eyes awake physically and still spiritually be asleep. Mine, we're looking out the window, far, far, it's just, it's over here. No, listen, focus. Look what it says. Gather about the sanctuary now. Let's gather about. So we need to demonstrate them where? In daily life. Is this salvific? Somebody says, well, don't study that. It's not salvific. Is this salvific? Yeah. This is, is, what we're talking about is life and death. I set before you by God's grace, us, life and death. Therefore, choose life. It says, this is essential to salvation. We shall have to study how? We're going to rush through it and understand this. We shall have to study earnestly, prayerfully, tax the mind. You know what Daniel said? He said, my cognitations much troubled me. And if your cognitations haven't troubled you yet, you haven't studied enough. I've had my cognitations trouble. Have you? It says, Prayerful in order to understand these grand truths, demonstrate the three angels in daily life. Now, we have to make sure we understand what the key is. Brother Mason's already dealt with it, but it's time to repeat it so that it's clear in our minds. We said the sanctuary is the key. Go to Psalms 77. What did I say? We want to make sure from the Bible we got that key. Amen? Psalm 77. Now, let's turn to the screen. You're going to Psalm 77, but let's also turn our attention to the screen as you go to Psalms 77. Now, please write it down. Write it down, Psalm 77. Look at this. Watch what it says now. Education, 125, 126. Write it down. Don't try to write down everything. Just write down key, education, 125, 126. Go back and study it later. We're going to read it from the screen. Education, 125. Look at what it says now. Let's read together very slowly. It says, the central theme of the... Have you heard that before? You must hear it again. And this repetition is going to strengthen our minds. The central theme of the Bible, talking about from Genesis to Revelation, right? The theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is what? So question now, what is the central theme? The plan of redemption. Now watch now, watch now. It says the restoration. Now notice again, it says the restoration. So there's something about the plan of redemption that talks about what? Write down on your papers, restoration. Now, when John came, he came to restore all things. And you're going to find out that it says in Acts 3.19, going over to 21, it says he's going to send the Holy Spirit uh, in his presence. And he says, whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution of all things. So that Jesus can't leave heaven until everything has been what? restore now wait a minute now so this says restoration now this says something about the plan of redemption has to do with restoration the restoration of what in the human soul of the what image of God now I want to ask you a question before we keep reading this stop that reading for a moment now I want you to be with me let's go to Leviticus 26 what book did I say do you know that redemption includes two great things how many when you hear redemption Literally, literally, because God uses the natural to explain the spiritual. Redemption was a natural, physical, literal word that God used to give them spiritual lessons. Question, what is, redeem, uh, what is uh, redemption talking about? Because in the Old Testament, they had a lot of things about redeeming. They could redeem the land. They could redeem properties, their wives. They did this so that God could teach them the plan of redemption. When you think about redemption, what do you think about? What is that talking about? Redeeming us? Okay. What did you say? Thank you, brother. Literal. Paying for something. If you said, you hear a store, a store, you can redeem this at your place. What are they talking about? You can buy it. You can get it, right? This is what God is using. They assemble to teach us something. Now, watch now. But well, we're going to find out there are two great concepts to redemption. Now, in Leviticus 26, and beginning, I'm sorry, Leviticus 25. Now, Leviticus 25 takes in the Jubilee year, talks about all these symbols of redemption, but I want you to notice something very clear, carefully. Beginning, now remember, what is this verse talking about? Do you know what this verse is talking about right here? Now, before you look down, you should tell me what the verse is talking about. You know how? Because look, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the how much is Leviticus in the book of the Bible. So you know what it's talking about. 
The whole book in the Bible, it's a, a cluster. It's a, every other in the whole book is the redemption plan. We're going to find out every passage is talking about this. So you have a picture now. When you put together a puzzle, and you put together a 500-piece puzzle, in order to, when you dump it out and you have all these pieces, you don't know where they go yet, what do you do? You put up a what? You put up a what, sister? You put up a picture. And when you put up that picture, guess what happens? You begin to put things together by looking at the picture. Well, the picture to put together the Bible is the redemption plan. Are you following? And once you understand it, then you have the key to put the other verses all together. So if you know it's talking about redemption, you know it. Now, let's watch something now. Let's read verses 51. Leviticus 26, verse 51. 25, excuse me. Leviticus 25, verse 51. Let's read it together. What does it say? If there be yet many years behind... According to them, he shall give again the price of his, the price of his what? So what's the central theme? The plan of? Now watch now. Out of the money that he was what? Bought for. When something is bought, what do you do? You've paid for it. Is that right? Listen, brothers and sisters. So redemption includes the price for redemption, but that's not it. Look at verse 55. Last verse, Leviticus 25, 55. It says, For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord their God. So it's not only to be bought, it is to be brought. Oh, I love the truth. It's not only to be bought, but it is to be brought. Is there a difference from being bought and from being brought. The, the bought of sin is the price paid. On Calvary, Jesus bought redemption, but he did not brought redemption. What does it mean to be brought? If you're over here and I say, bring me that book, what must the book do? That book must come where I am. Now, what separates us from Jesus? Sin created separation. Then in order to be brought back to Jesus, what has to be taken away? Sin. Do you see it? So I can pay the price, but in order to be brought back, I must be restored back into the condition I was in before sin separated me. Are you with me? That's an atonement. You are bought in the outer court. You were completely brought back in the most holy place. Are you following me? Now, what has to happen first? Do you know that God had to legally do it this way first? I want to ask you a question. Let's say a man, you're on the side of the street right here in Atlanta, and you're driving down. What's this street right here? Somebody, what's this street here? Dunwoody. You're driving down Dunwoody, and all of a sudden you draw by and you see a car. The car's on the side of the street. But it's one of these old, uh, timey cars, and you know it can make a lot of money to finish this work. Amen? Not to, not to, not to get some housing car. A lot, of work, a lot of money to do what? Finish the work. You know some mechanics that can fix it up. And so you look at it, and the car says, for sale. And so you go over to the car, and you say, well, the man's selling it anyway. And so all of a sudden, you bring your mechanic, and you take the car, and you bring it to your house. Mind you, you didn't pay for it yet. You bring it to your house, and then all of a sudden, you work on it, and you fix it back just the way it was. Is that all right? Wait a minute, you fixed it though. Is that all right? Is that lawful? That's not lawful. That's not fair. Follow me now. We're talking about vindicating God's character. That's not fair. So what has to happen before you can work on that car? You've got to buy it first. So before Jesus had to, the right to restore in man God's image, he had to first do what? Pay the price. He had to buy us before he could fix us and bring us back. And the devil said, if you try to fix them, Lord, before you buy them, I will say unfair. But he paid the price on Calvary so that the worst sinner in this world, if he comes to Jesus, I don't care how much divorcing, how much killing, how much stealing, how much eating the wrong things, looking at the wrong things, even up to today, if it comes to Jesus, there is some blood that can take it away. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners can plunge beneath that flood and lose not some, but all of their guilty stains. But is it enough for me to buy that car and then leave it in my house and I don't fix it? 
You know what I got to do to that? I've got to bring it back. I've got to restore it. So it says the plan of redemption includes both. Are you with me? It says the central thing of the Bible, the thing about which everyone in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan. With that picture, did you see Leviticus 26 better? It says in the human, uh, in the, is the plan of redemption, the restoration where? In the human soul of the image of God from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden. Where was the first intimation of hope given us that there was going to be a plan to restore us? Now, it existed already, but when was it first intimated or revealed to us? Now, you sound like you're in the school of the prophets. Praise God. Genesis 3.15. Talk about that enmity, right? Now, remember, we got to put together. Genesis 3.15, Daniel 8.14, Revelation 14, 6 through 12. It says, from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the revelation. Talking about Revelation 22.4. They shall see his face and his what? Name shall be where? Did we hear about that last, in the last presentation? That means that God has restored in us his character if we have his name in our foreheads. Am I right? Then it says, and his name is in our foreheads, Revelation 22.4. Now, let's say this together. Please, let's read this together. It says, the burden of how much? So when I go to Genesis, what's the burden? The plan of redemption. When I go to Exodus, what's the burden? Plan of redemption. When I go to Leviticus, what's the burden? Plan of redemption. When you understand this, now watch. The burden of every book and every you mean every verse? That's, this is it? This is it. It says, the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. What theme is this? The central theme is the plan of redemption. It says, man's uplifting. God restoring us, not only buying us back, but bringing us back. It says, man's uplifting. The power of God, which give us us the, he's going to bring us back to the place where we have the victory over every sin. Which gives us the victory through our Lord, can we do it by ourselves? Who is it through? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He who grasps what? What is this thought? You've got to tell me what this thought is. Not just the redemption plan, but the, the fact. No, let me not say it. Let me, what is this thought that it says? The, 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 the central theme is the redemption plan is the first part of it. What's the second part? That every book of the Bible and every passage of the Bible, it is trying to unfold this. Are you with me? When you understand that every verse, every book, every chapter is for this, the unfolding of the plan of redemption, it says, he who grants this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He not will have, he has the key. Oh, I love it. Do you love it? He has the key. He has the what? What does he have the key to? He has the key that will unlock to him how much? The whole treasure house of God's word. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I understand the plan of redemption, I will not get the key. I have the key. That means we have to understand this redemption plan. Is that right? Now, wait a minute. Do you, do you have a conflict? Think of it. I read in Great Controversy that the subject of the sanctuary was the key. But here comes the same spirit prophecy telling me that the plan of redemption is the key. Well, which one is right? You sound like a student in the school of the prophets. Both. And what we must see is not conflict. We must see harmonious unity. See, the reason why we have so many mess up on text is because we don't do this. Now, I introduced this point. I was trying to look for the slide that, uh, 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 that the artist that, by God, that God used Elder Mason to put together, but I couldn't find it. You had to give it to me again. It's lost somewhere in my slides. But there's something called cross hairs. What? You ever seen something like this on a rifle? Right? And a person is trying to aim at something. He's aiming at it. He's trying to get it. Well, if they want to get, if you want to get a sharp shooter, then you have to have the crosshairs on. Is that right? Is that going to make? Is that, is that going to? Is that going to make sure he hits his target when it's like that? He has to move that those crosshairs until it gets where. Now, when he pulls the trigger, is he going to hit the target? Now, we want this target to be what we call present truth. Are you following me? And we've got to get present truth every time we study. Are you following me? But you've got to use the crosshairs in order to arrive at present truth. Amen? Now, what are the crosshairs? The crosshairs are two different positions. 
The first is the Bible. The what? The Bible. You must make sure when you're studying a subject, find out what the Bible says about it as it relates to the plan of redemption. Walk it through. But when you line up just what the Bible says, do you have a crosshair on it? What do you need now? You need something else that's going to crosshair it. Oh, yes. You need the what? Spirit of prophecy. And as a student has this, as he studies the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, no matter what he's studying, whether it's health, whether it's the home, whether it's in education, whether it's in country living, whether it's in raising uh, anything, whatever you do, anything in life, you, in every duty of daily life, you got to get a cross here on it to make sure you got it right so that you're on the target of present truth. Does it make sense? Now, my brothers and sisters, some of us, we get what the Bible says, but don't see what the spirit of prophecy says. And sometimes we have the Bible not lining up with the spirit of prophecy. That means that we're not on target. Are you following me? Or we see what the Spirit of Prophecy says, and it doesn't seem to line with the Bible. The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are not wrong because the Spirit of the Prophets are subject to the Prophets. So when you see conflict, you're not on target. But when you get the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy saying the same thing about the same subject, you can assure that you're on target and you have arrived at present truth. Does it make sense? So we're getting crosshairs. We've been doing this all the time, but I want to demonstrate it. As you study, you must do the same thing. Are you with me? This is why the remnant church have not only the commandments of God, but God gave them a crosshair so they wouldn't miss. Because listen, if you had 10 bullets and a bear is right upon you. I remember a man told me a story. A bear was getting ready to get him, and he was hunting bears. This man wasn't a seven day Senator Venice, he was hunting bears. He said, he, 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 just as the bear was almost upon him, he shot at the bear. He killed the bear just before it almost fall, fell on him and killed him. Now, let me tell you something. If you're, you're running from a bear and you have 10 bullets, you're shooting. Time makes, you know how you scare. You're just shooting. But if you have one bullet left, what are you going to do? You're going to aim. The remnant church is God's last opportunity to finish the work. And so God says, I've got to give them a crosshair. They got one chance to do it. They can't miss. So he gave them not only the Bible and the commandments of God, but he gave them the testimony of Jesus, which is the We will be self-confident if we think we can put the crosshair down and still hit the target with one bullet. Now, he who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has the key. Now, what's my problem? Is the subject of the sanctuary the key or is the plan of redemption the key? Both. Then we must see that. Amen? Now, inspiration tells us that already. It says the plan of redemption is the key. The subject of sanctuary is the key. When you're in math, you do those theorems and you go through. I remember I love math. I hated every other subject, but I love math. And you did geometry and you go through and you, you check them. And every side, when you say this equals this, this equals this, and you get down to the bottom, if this equals this, then they're the same. Is that right? So you know they're the same from the spirit of prophecy, but how do we get it from the Bible? Because we need a crosshair. Go to Psalm 77. The Bible says, beginning in verse 13, we've been reading and reading, and I want us to see it again. Verse 13 says what? Let's read it together. It says, that, now remember now, Genesis 3.15, Daniel 8.14. How does this connect with Daniel 8.14? The Bible says in Daniel 8.14, and he said unto me, unto 2,000 and 300 days, then shall the... So this introduces the sanctuary, Daniel 8.14. Is that right? That's the key. Now, Psalm 77 says, beginning in verse 13, all together, thy way... Oh, God is not outside, but where? Amen. In the sanctuary. When you get in there, you know what you're going to say like David? Who is so great a God? You see, when you're not in the sanctuary, you may think, I, but when you get into the sanctuary, you say, God is good. And the goodness of God leads us to repentance so we can be converted, that our sins may be blotted out. Now, this says, thy will, God, is in the sanctuary. So the question should be, what way? Right? He said, thy way. But my question is, what way is in the sanctuary? Is that a good question? Then let's get an answer. And let's not get a man's answer. Let's get a biblical answer. In verses, a uh, little verse down, he talks about it. In verse 19, he talks about this way. It says, it, I normally have a little slide on this, but I can't go to it right now. Verse 19 says, thy way way is where wait a minute now first he said thy way is in the sanctuary now he says thy way is in the what what is he talking about thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great what waters 
and thy footsteps are not what? Known. What are you talking about, thy ways in the sea? Verse 20. Thou did what? Ledest thy people like a flock by the hand of who? So question. When did he lead? What sea did God use Moses and Aaron to lead his people through? The Red Sea. So something says there's something about the Red Sea that shows us the way of the sanctuary. Is that right? Do you see that? Is that clear? There's something about the Red Sea, and when, when God used most to lead them through, that led them through the sanctuary. And you know already it has something to do with redemption. Is that right? Because every passage. Let's go to Exodus, and we'll come right back to Psalm 77. Let's go to Exodus uh, chapter 6. How God led Moses through the Red Sea. We won't read every verse, but you know the story. Exodus 6, look at what it says. God took them through the Red Sea when they were leaving. Where were they leaving from? From Egypt. Egypt is a type of bondage. Is that right? What is the spiritual bondage we're in right now? Jesus said to the people of the Jews, he said, you're in bondage. They said, we have been in bondage to no man. Jesus said, he whosoever committed sin is the servant, the slave, the bondman of sin. So the Egyptian bondage is a type of the bondage of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this sin? body of death. That was a bondage. When we're in sin, you can't stop sinning. What about a man when he can't stop sinning? That man's in sl slavery. Is that right? He wants to leave sin, but he can't leave. He wants to get out, but he can't. He's in bondage. He wants to do right, but he can't. He's in bondage. He needs a deliverer. So Exodus 6 says, when they came out the Red Sea, they were delivered from that bondage. They were redeemed. Exodus 6, beginning in verse 5. What does it say? And I heard the what? Groanings of the children of what? Israel, whom the Egyptians kept where? But remember now, though it's talking about the Egyptian bondage, this is really a type trying to explain to us the plan of? This is the key. It says, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. And what do you do? Verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am what? The Lord. And I will not only buy you out, but I will what? Bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will do what? You mean to tell me he's going to get rid of sin? I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will do what? Redeem you with how? So when they left Egypt and went through the Red Sea, they were redeemed from Egypt. Is that what the Bible says? Then it says, Thy way, O God. Let's go back to Psalm 77. So they left through the Red Sea. When they went through the Red Sea, they were being what? Redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. So they are being taken out of Egypt and they are being redeemed. Now in Psalm 77, so when he says, Thy way is in the sea where you led Moses and Aaron, when you led your people, he was saying that there's a way in there and this is the way of redemption. Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary, but it's the way of... Now let's watch the Bible say that in plain language. Verse 13, let's start over again. Psalm 77, 13, it says, Thy way, O oh God, is where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Verse 14. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength. How do you do this? By the miracles and the wonders and bringing them out of Egypt, the ten plagues. And then it says in verse 15, Thou hast with thine arm done what? Redeem thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The water saw thee, O God. The water saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. When you were, brothers and sisters, the way that God, the way that's in the sanctuary is the way that he redeemed what? That he redeemed his people. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What way? Verse 15 says, thou hast with thine arm done what? So what is the way that's in the sanctuary? The way of? In other words, God shows us in the sanctuary how he's going to redeem man. So then now, if that's true, then you can see how the subject of the sanctuary can be the key and the plan of redemption can be the key because it is the sanctuary that reveals the plan of? Do you see it? Do you see it? And we're going to come back to this now. Watch this now. It says the burden of every book of the Bible, every passage, he who has this has the key. They will unlock to him all the treasure house of God's word. Look what this says. Great Controversy 48. Let's read this. Great Controversy 48. It says, how much? All. How much? All who have received the light 
upon the subject, these subjects, talking about the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has what? Committed to them. He gave us something. Let's read this together slowly. Let's read it together. Now, this is the crosshair. We saw it from the Bible. Let's get a crosshair to make sure the target is right. It says, the sanctuary in what? Heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man. It concerns how many? Does it concern everybody on the DVDs, listening on the internet? Does it concern them? Does it concern us in here? It concerns every person living, every denomination, every person in the world, every person living. It says, the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man, it concerns every soul living upon the earth. What does the sanctuary do? Now remember, the key unlocks, is that right? It opens to view the what? Did we see that from the Bible? Did we see that from the Bible? Yes or no? It said it opens to view the plan of redemption doing what? Bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that not some, but how much? All should thoroughly investigate these subjects, but not just know them for themselves. Paul says in 1 Peter 3.15 that we should be able to give an answer to every man that asks us for the hope that is within us. 1 Peter 3.15. It says that they're going to investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer. How much? To everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is where? In them. Do you have this hope that burns within your heart? Do you have a hope burning in your heart right now? A hope in this coming of the Lord that can never take place until the work is finished. And this work can never be finished until we have the subject of the sanctuary. We see it and understand it. This is the key. The plan of redemption, the subject of the sanctuary. It un unlocks the entire Bible. Yea, it unlocks the duties in which we must do to finish the work. And this key was given back to us in what year? Who was that man right there? Hiram X. He was a farmer. F. Behan was a doctor. I see a hand right here. I see a hand, please. Would it be safe? Um, I'm looking at Psalms 77, um, the one you read about the, not 13, but the one you read about the, the way is the sea. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, could it be safe then to even think of with the Passover, um, it represented the altar and then as you pass through the Red Sea, it represented the um, altar of, uh, not the altar, but the labor. Yeah. And, and so it, can you put those two together and, too? Uh, in, in a sense, because okay. it's baptism. You'll find out when you read 1 Corinthians 10, it says they were baptized in that Red Sea too. Okay. Praise God. All right. Let's not miss the point here. F. Behan with, was with him and Crozier, F. Behan was a doctor. Crozier was a teacher. And so when they got together and all studied it out, they said, well, the farmer said, well, I don't think I can write good enough. The doctor said, well, they said, you write it, doctor, we may not all understand it. So they told Crozier to write it, who was the teacher. And you'll find out that Crozier actually wrote it. This is how it happened. This is, this is literally what happened. In 1840, he wrote it. He was the one who wrote it. Hiram and so on, but he, as they studied together, he wrote it, and they sent out an extra, and Sister White said that everyone should read it. I have the extra. You've got to study this, brothers and sisters. Going back to 1844. Now, what did they see? Watch now. The passing of time in 1844 was followed by a period of what? Great trial to those who still held the Ivan faith. They were disappointed. They didn't know where the solution was. It says their only relief so far as ascertaining their true position was concerned was the light which directed their minds where? To the what? Sanctuary above. Not the one on earth, but the sanctuary in heaven. Some renounced their faith in their former reckoning of the prophetic periods and ascribe to human or satanic agencies the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit which had attended the Advent movement. Some people went back to the Catholic Church, back to the Methodist Church, back to all, some stopped going to church. But those who held on, they said, Lord, we were disappointed, but we don't believe the Bible was wrong, we believe we were wrong. They went back and began to study it. Are you following me? It says, another class firmly held that the Lord had led them in their past experience and as they waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God they saw that their great high priest had entered upon another work of ministration and following him how by faith remember 2nd Corinthians 5 7 we walk by faith and not by sight we can follow Christ from the outer court in when we walk by faith and it says following him by faith they were led to what see so they saw something watch now 
They were led to see the closing work of the church as they saw Jesus move from the holy to the most holy place. They saw also how to finish the work, the closing work of the church. They had a clearer understanding of the what? Why? Because the subject of the sanctuary is the key that shows us the contents inside of the three angels' messages. So it says they had a clearer understanding of the first and second angels' messages and were prepared to receive and give to the world the solemn warning of the third angel of Revelation 14. Now watch now. It says, question, what did they see? That's my question. What did they see? Hiram Edson literally saw in vision Jesus move from the what? Holy to the most holy place. But when they started studying the scripture, did they see that same thing? Question, did they see that? When they studied the scriptures, they read in Daniel 7 that a judgment was set. They read where the ancient moved from the holy to the most holy place and the son of man followed from the holy to the most holy and they understood that that judgment was not Jesus coming to judge the earth as we think it is uh, coming in the second time, but that judgment was Jesus moving to the ancient of days to start the judgment, the investigative judgment before Jesus comes. Does it make sense? They saw that the world was not the sanctuary. It was the outer court of the sanctuary. But that the sanctuary was in heaven. They saw this. Now I want to ask you a question. Is this what they saw? Were they shown an 1843 chart? Did the 1843 chart solve their disappointment? Now some of you may not understand it, but some of you will who are here, and some of you will who are looking. There are good men that are telling us in order to finish the work that we must see this. And there's a certain number associated with it. 2520. Is that what God showed higher medicine? No. Then what God did to lead his people to finish the work, we must follow. Those, and I, we did a study. I have a study of everyone who taught the 2520 before they understood the sanctuary. And then find out that after the sanctuary was presented, everyone who studied the 2520, who did not, uh, who did not reject it after they understood the sanctuary, left the Seventh Adventist Church. Every one of them. And the only ones that remained who taught it before, who set the sanctuary and then stopped teaching it, was Joseph Bates and James White. Both of them taught it before, but they ended up rejecting it and ended up starting teaching only the sanctuary. I have good men that I know and love that are teaching this right now. So I say it's not because the people are evil. Men who are deep students in the Bible believe this, but my friends, we're not to follow man. We're to follow who? What did God do? What did God show his people to explain the disappointment? He didn't show them no 2520. This is what he showed them. Look what it says. It says, there what? What is only? Nothing else. So no, no 1843, nothing else. Their only relief so far as ascertaining their true position was concerned was the light which directed their minds to the sanctuary above. Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. We got to get in there. What did they see in there? They didn't see no numbers. It was not chronology that they saw in there. The 2300 days took them somewhere, but guess who they saw? They saw Jesus. They saw the high priest move from the holy to the most holy place. And as they did this, watch now. Council of Rising Editors, page 30. It says, The passing of the time in what? 1844 was a period of great events opening to our what? astonished eyes they were surprised at what they would see they knew the 2520 at this time they thought that that was going to take them somewhere but it opened to our astonished eyes what the cleansing of the sanctuary what number takes us to the cleansing of the sanctuary now I want you to understand something now transpiring where in heaven and what else did they see having what decided relation to God's people where so what they saw is that what Jesus is doing up there affects what is going on where? And they saw that what they're doing down here can prevent what he's doing up there. Watch it now. Because it says they, oh, their astonished eyes was that the cleansing of the sanctuary transpired in heaven had a what? That there was a relationship between the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven and what the people were doing on earth. 
Do you think that it's possible that we can live in a way that will prevent the high priest from cleansing the sanctuary? Do you think so? And so there are some duties that we're to be doing that will allow him to finish his work up there. Let me keep going. So we drop the 25 turn. We've come back to what happened in the most holy place. Now, understanding the finishing work. When they saw this, guess what began to open up before them? They saw not only how to finish the work, but it says here, it says, but the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord in what year? Were they ready yet? They were, there was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given, directing their minds where? To the temple of God in heaven. Does the Bible say that? Go to Revelation 11. Let's go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Heavenly Father, we have a few more minutes to bring these points out. Help us to see it, Lord. We're going to connect Genesis 3.15, Daniel 8.14 to Revelation 14. And Lord, we need you to help us make it plain. Lord, I'm just a weak, ignorant vessel. Please, Lord. We want to help you finish this work, Lord. You gave us a part. Help us, Lord. Because without you, we can do nothing. You want our fellowship, Lord. Nothing in between you and I, Lord. We want to know you, Lord. Please come down right now, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, but the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. 1844 disappointment. There was still a what? This was the finishing work. A work to be given, a work, to be, a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God where? In heaven. Now watch what happens. As they look at that temple of God in heaven, they should by faith follow the high priest and his administration there. What would take place? Wait a minute. Not old duties, but what? New duties will be revealed. This is the work of the school of the prophets to find out what these duties are so we can finish the work. What needs to be done? So it says that they follow him, they would see new what? Duties would be revealed, another message of warning, and instruction was to be given to the church. This is in the Holy of Holies, Great Controversy 424, 425. They would see new duties. Let's, we're in Revelation 11. Are you there? Amen? amen. Now let's get a cross here on that. We saw him in the spirit of prophecy. Now look at it from the Bible. The Bible will say the same thing. Revelation 11, verse 19. We're going to see what God showed them in heaven. Because somebody says, what did they see? If it wasn't uh, a number, what did they see? Revelation 11, 19. Let's see what they saw. Revelation 11, 19. Let's read it. It says, and the temple of God was what? Open in heaven. And there was what? Seen. Did they see something? Then must we see it? We're going to find that there will never be a revival of primitive godliness until we see what they saw. And it's only when the law is restored back to its proper place that there will be a, a revival of primitive godliness among us. It, that law is perfect, converting the soul. Revelation 11 says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the what? Ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Question, what did they see? They saw the ark of his testimony or the ark of the covenant. Are you with me? What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Ten Commandments. What was on the side of the Ark of the Covenant? The Book of the Law. The Book of the Law. Remember now, that was a type of a further edition that God gave us in the antitype. Has God given the remnant church some books of the law? We've been reading them. The Book of the Law is the testimonies of the prophets. Now I want to ask you a question. Was it in the most holy place? So then when the light came that opened up the sanctuary, we could not get the prophetic gift back of the books of the law until after the door was open in heaven. Then the ark with the testimony is seen, and after the disappointment, that's when Sister White got her first vision. Because the light was open as they saw the ark, God said, but you can't just see the ark because you're too blind. You need some bifocals. Give them the book of the law. Come on, brothers and sisters. Now, when they did this, new duties would be, oh, I would, boy, I wish we just had time, brothers and sisters. New duties would be revealed, another message. Now, now, let me get another point. New duties. When they saw the law, they saw what? New duties. Is that in the Bible? They, what was in the ark? Tell me what was in the ark. The law of God. What is the law of God? Now, I want you to listen. You're right. But the wise man said, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole what? 
You mean to tell me they saw a new duty? I wonder if the laws of health are contained in the law of God. And so I wonder if it was after that ark was seen that we will be given the natural laws, reveal them, that we would also see health reform and medical missionary work. I wonder if that was one of the duties. I'm trying to get you to see something. As they saw the law, every duty, the whole duty of man was revealed, but we don't necessarily see that. Oh, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we don't recognize that when we eat the wrong things, is it shortening our life? Is it killing us? But that law says, thou shalt not. So you mean to tell me when I eat the wrong things, I'm killing myself? I'm violating the sixth commandment? How do we see it? God gives us a magnifying glass so we can see the new duty that we should eat properly. We shouldn't eat any food that's going to lessen our life and flesh foods kills us. We need to eat foods that are going to give us life, add to our life. Are you with me? This is the whole duty of man, but you don't see this until you go inside of what? The most holy place. That's why our habits of eating and drinking will determine if we've gone into the most holy place. Now, is the three angels' messages going to bring us to the place where we do every duty? How do we know? Yes, my brother. How does the third angel conclude? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that are not trying anymore. They receive in their heart the first, the second, and the third angel. And as a result, it's done something to them. They've been not only bought, but they've been brought back, restored into the image of God. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the what? The whole duties. The commandments of God. And have the faith of is this faith different from Jesus? If you love Jesus, are you going to reject this faith or are you going to hold this faith? If you love Jesus, you're going to be a commandment keeper. What do you say? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the man says he knows God and doesn't keep his commandments. He is a liar. New duties open up. Look what this says. At a meeting held in Dor Dorchester, Massachusetts, November 1848, I have been given a view of the proclamation of the sealing message. What year is this? Has the door been opened in the most holy place? When was the temple open in heaven? October 22nd, 1844. It had to be that day because it tells us what room. When you see furniture in the room, you know what room you are in the sanctuary. Am I right? If you see a, in a house, you see a, a, a sink uh, and a Vitamix and a counter. What room am I in? Kitchen. That's furniture. If you see a commode and a bathtub, what room am I in? So the furniture tells you what room you're in. Is that right? So when the, when the temple is open in heaven, you need to know which room, holy or most holy. When you look at the furniture, you know the room. They're seeing the ark of his testimony, the ark of the covenant. What room is that? How many days of the year was the most holy open up on? What day? So when it says the temple was open, only one day. This has to be the day of atonement when they saw this. And on 1844, according to Daniel 14, October 22nd, 1844, the, do the door was open. They saw the law. They saw the new duties that began to come. But light didn't come all at once. The, 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 the path of the justice is a shining light that shines how? So those new duties will be revealed more and more until the work is finished. It says, look now, it says, at meeting in Dor Dorchester, uh, Massachusetts, November this is four years after 1844, a duty was revealed. Watch now. It says, I've been given a view of the proclamation of the sealing message and of the duty, the what? Of the brethren, brethren to do what? You mean that one of our duties is not only to preach this, but to publish this? Is that right? And the publishing association forms the foundation to all media. You mean to tell me when we have these cameras and we put it on the internet, you mean to tell me that's part of this publishing? Yes. So it says, brethren, a duty of the brethren to publish the light that was shining upon our pathway. After the coming out of vision, you know what happened? Sister White was in vision. She was getting a vision of the ceiling message. And when she came up, she looked at her husband and said, you must write, write, write. She said, I said to my husband, I have a message for you. You must begin to print a little paper. Let me tell you something. When you go home, you must begin to print some of these papers. 
You need to turn your home to a publishing house. Take these and start publishing and getting these out. We're going to find out why when we keep going. This is necessary in order to get victory over sin. All these duties. Wait a minute now. After, uh, you must be in a print of a little paper and send it out to the people. Let it be small at first. But as the people read, they will send you means with which to print. And it will be a success from the what? First, from the small beginning, it was shown to me to be like streams of light that went clear around the world. We can't go there now, but we find out education was one of the duties. But we're going to keep going. I want to get ready to bring it to a close. Here's the Ten Commandments. Well, I can't fully go through this now. I, 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 I'm going to go to... Uh, I, I, we'll come back to it. Don't worry. We'll come back to it. It's the book of the law. We found an Einstein. You remember the theory? What was the theory that allowed Einstein to, 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 to allow them to come up with the atomic bomb? What was the theory? Could they use it back there? It was only a theory. But then they found through the chain reaction how to make theory come into a what? That could be demonstrated day to life. Do we need a theory? Yes. You're getting a theory here that must be converted by a chain reaction. So when you leave in here, you want to find out this chain reaction is going to bring institutions of outposts into existence. We're giving you the seed that's getting ready to bring this into existence. If they found it out, it took almost 40 years for them to convert it. We're going to find out. I can't go through the number. In 1844, we got the theory of what's going to create this explosion that's going to finish the work. And it took almost 40 years, but we, we, we'll go back. We found out that it was the seeing. What did they see? All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement, which is going on where? In the sanctuary above, when this grand truth is, remember there was seen in Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. When it is seen and what else? Understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand and will they fail or succeed? In the great day of God and their efforts will be won. So this is the principle. To understand what's going on in the most holy place, we will succeed. We found out that the subject of the sanctuary was the key. It brought to view all these duties, all the light. This is present truth. But now let's get ready to close here. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, that it is going to bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his head. Is that right? So it says that Jesus is going to bruise the head of the serpent. Question. Has that happened or when does that happen? Has that happened already? I see some people say yes. It's already happened. What do some people say? Does everybody say yes? Let me see your hand. Everybody says yes. I see everybody says yes. Has the head of Satan been completely bruised? Yes or no? I want you to listen. To this. I want you to understand. We're talking about finishing the so where, and so it's been completely bruised. Now, every evangelical teacher will tell you that the head of Satan has been completely bruised at the cross. Let's go to Romans 16. Let's go there. Romans 16. Romans, the 16th chapter. Beginning in verse 20. Here is Paul. Is this before the cross or after the cross? This is after the cross. Paul is converted after the cross. He's writing to the Roman church, so this is years after the cross. Romans 16, beginning in verse 20, and let's read what the Bible says. And the what? God of peace shall bruise Satan under what? Your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Question. If his head has been already bruised completely, no need to bruise it again. Is that right? Now, what tense, past, present, or future? After the cross, Romans 16, 20 says, Satan and the God of peace, what's that next word? Shall. Is that past, present, or future? So it says, after the cross, there's going to be a future bruising of Satan's head. Right or wrong? And under the feet of the church, shortly. But that's all right. The church is the body of Christ. It's still Christ joining. Is that right? It's just his body. He's going to do it through his spiritual body. Now, watch now. So it says that he's going to bruise under your feet. So that tells us that some bruising still needs to happen after the cross. Now, guess what a converted scholar would do if he did this? Now, watch this now. Converted scholar now. Here's the bruising of the head. Boom. That head's bruised. What do you say? Jesus began the bruising at the cross of Calvary. It's called the place of the skulls, Golgotha. It started the bruising process. When he said, it is finished, 
the taking away of sin from the earth started in reality the bruising process. Are you following me? But did it finish it? We're talking about finishing the work. Now, Genesis 3.15 is telling us not about the cross alone. Genesis 3.15 is telling us about the plan of redemption, which is a complete system. Is the cross the whole plan of redemption? Is it part of it? So then the cross, the Genesis 3.15 is not talking about just the cross. Genesis 3.15 is talking about the plan of redemption. So Genesis 3.15 is only a, uh, the cross is only a part of what's going to do Genesis 3.15, not the whole. Are you following me? The seed started the process. The remnant of her seed is going to finish the process. Here's the cross. Now watch. We got to get a cross there on that. Let's get, we sound the Bible. Well, watch this now. This is the word. Now, the original Greek word that's used, now this is what the scholar will tell you, amen? A converted scholar. The Greek word for, the, for bruise is sun tribal. Say that with me. Sun tribal. You don't have to be smart. You can take your concordance and read it. It means sun tribal. From the word 4862, that's the Greek. To crush what? That's what the Greek says. So in other words, a crushing has started, but when God is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly, he is not going to start a, or give a partial bruising. He is going to completely bruise it or finish the... That is, to shatter, literally break, broken to shivers, bruise, to crush how? Completely. It started at the cross, but guess what? It must be finished on the day of, of atonement. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to get ready to close here. Oh, I want to take and, and, and pull this thing through, but we, we, we come, we're coming to the close here. Do you remember on the Day of Atonement? What was the last part of the Day of Atonement? After the priest. Now, we're gonna go, we're gonna go, now no, I'm going to tell you today, but repeating is good. I'm going to go back over in more detail tomorrow. Is that all right? On the Day of Atonement, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the congregation has done its duty. The priest has done his duty. He goes into the sanctuary. You can read in Leviticus 16, 23, and he sprinkles the blood seven times over the Ark of the Covenant. This is a shadow. This is a type. Why seven times? Completion. So he's finishing the work. He, can, he applies the blood. Now, what did he do? When he has sprinkled the blood the first time, it transferred sin from the sinner to the substitute to the sanctuary. Now he's going to transfer sin from the sanctuary. He's got to get rid of it now. So now the priest comes out. And on the day of atonement, he comes to the outer court. And he takes that sin. What does he take? And this is very important, brothers and sisters. I'm going to show you the text all tomorrow. I wish we had time just today. But he takes the sin, and the priest puts it where? On the, on the head of the scapegoat. Who does the scapegoat represent? That old serpent. And as he puts that sin on the head of the scapegoat, it will crush his head. Separates out, leaves in the camp, dies with the sin on his head. He dies and sin and sinners are no more. This will finish the work. This is Seventh-day Adventism, brothers and sisters. But listen to me. Listen to me. Where does the priest get the sin that crushes the head of Satan? Whose sin is it? Your sin and my sin. And if we don't give it to him, he can't crush the serpent's head. I remember a snake came in, uh, into our garden. I was there and I'm like a little child. Please give me two minutes to close it. Can I have two minutes? S snake came into, you know, I'm like a little child. I plant the garden and the next day I'm watching the garden. This, this, has it come up yet? I didn't come up. I know it's not coming up yet, but I just like to look out the window. A few hours later. I'm doing work in the office and then going, and I come back and look out the window again. Look, same, same girl. And a day later, I'm doing the same thing. And finally, and finally. One day, I just been in the morning, and I just drunk some water. And I said, let me look over the garden. And I looked over and I saw a snake. And I would have let it, they said, somebody says, well, is it a good snake? 
Or bad stages, you let them live. Listen. <laughs> I kill first and ask questions later. <laughs> Amen. Now afterwards, I came out and I grabbed a shovel. I have my shovel right there, and I'm watching the snake. Now, I tell you, this last time, I did it several times, but this last time, I was getting ready to let him go. But he started coming toward my house. And so I said, I better kill him. And so I came over to where he was, and with the first one, I, I, I counted, cut him down, I took the, 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 uh, the shovel, and I stopped him with one, but then I had another one. Guess what I did with that one? I crushed his head. And I took a picture of it just to remind the old devil. <laughs> and listen. Any man that would talk to a woman without seeing her husband or father is a serpent. We sometimes need to do the same thing with him. Crush his head. <laughs> but in the, in the Lord, amen? Now, this tells us that you need, I needed that shovel to crush his head. What if I was right there out there and I only had one shovel and I'm holding a snake down with one and there's one more shovel on the ground but I can't reach it because if I let it go, it's too late. And I say, somebody, give me the shovel. And my family's right there. Say, give me the family. I want to kill the snake. Give me a shovel. Give me the shovel so I can kill the snake. And all of a sudden, the person over there with the shovel, woo, it's a killer snake. I'm saying, please, give me the shovel. And, and it's coming, and you're getting ready to walk by it, and you will die if it gets you. I'm saying, please, give me the shovel. I need the shovel in order to kill the snake. Am I right? Brothers and sisters, I fancy I see Jesus, the Son of Man. That's the man, the man Christ Jesus, with the shovel. What's the shovel? Sin. What is going to do? Crush the head of the serpent. And he says, I don't have sin. I didn't sin. You have sin. But if you give me your sin with the shovel, I can put it on his head, crush him, so the work can be finished, and we are playing with sin. How can we watch it on television? How can we wear it on our fingers and in our ears, playing with it on our bodies? Playing within these minds and pornography and all the rest. How can we do these evil things, selfishness between husband and wife, playing with sin when Jesus needs sin to crush the head of Satan? They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, not in, but from their sins. And the only way to do that is to separate it from us. Behold the Lamb of God, which... When he takes away that sin, he can crush his head, and the work will be. Well, that means there must come a generation that are through with sin so they can give it to him. I want to be one of those. What do you say? Do you see the work? Now we need to understand how to do that work. For if you do these things, you shall never fall, and then he can take it. I want Jesus. How about you? Do you want to spend time with him? Let's turn to him right now. Oh, Father, forgive my weak presentation, dear God. We've been here for 6,000 years. We're in the last few months. We see the economic crisis and the world thinks that it's going to get better, but we're going to see a complete collapse of the American economy. Revelation tells us this, leading to when no man can buy or sell and the setting up of the mark of the beast and the passing of a sunny lawness everywhere. And Lord, we must be ready by this time so there are many Christians that don't know this, that love God, but have never seen the most holy place. And we must show it to them, Lord. Show them Jesus. But Lord, as seven dead minutes, we're sleeping, oh God. And we're in this room, dear God. We don't have this experience. We don't know you. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you, Father, so that I can be through with sin, to give it to you, Lord, and stop playing with it so that you can finish the work. And no more will we be separated from you, but forever we can have fellowship. Please, Lord, grant us this experience. I pause the prayer. There's someone who's with me. If you're heart-to-heart -heart with Jesus this, this evening, and you want to send him the word that you want him to help you so that we can accomplish this working with him. Just raise your hand. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've done today in Jesus' name. Amen.